Well, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Austin Pugh, and I'm the NECAN coordinator, uh, the new NECAN coordinator for anyone that didn't attend the webinar on Monday. Uh, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2023 NECAN webinar series, highlighting monitoring priorities in the Northeast. This is our seventh webinar in this series, and today's theme is a continuation of Monday's theme, OA and biological impacts. With the assistance of this series and our wonderful presenters, the NECAN steering committee will be working on the development of a regional monitoring plan for OA. And these webinars will serve as a resource for them as this plan begins to come together. Updates on this series are shared through our mailing list and on the NECAN website. So be sure to check the website for the full webinar schedule. At the conclusion of today's presentations, the steering committee will be asking our panel some questions, and then we're going to open up for a bit of a more general Q&A session. And during that session, feel, please feel free to use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen or submit the questions and comments in the chat and our uh, discussion mon moderator will be able to ask them directly to the presenters. First up, we're gonna be hear, hearing from Shannon Mise. Uh, Shannon is a research chemist at NOAA NEFSC Milford Laboratory. And Shannon graduated from Old Dominion University with a degree in oceanography. She began her career at NOAA 21 years ago, investigating how environmental uh, changes affect shellfish. In the last decade, this has evolved into studying the effects of climate change on marine bivalves with focus on ocean acidification. During her spare time, she enjoys hiking the Appalachian Trail and hopes to finish it all. Uh, thanks, Shannon. Please, uh, you can share your slides now and start your presentation. Thank you for that introduction. So I'm really excited to be here and present um, my take on benthic organisms and how they respond to uh, changing climate, moving from laboratory experiments to field experiments and monitoring and how they all relate to each other and moving forward within the NECAN region. So benthic organisms, as we are all well aware of on the NECAM region is a very, um, it's the largest economic um, fisheries in the Northeast. It's about $2 billion with lobster and uh, sea scallops making up a majority of that, 75% of the revenue. And when you start including other bivalves, you're close to 80 to 85% of the revenue depending on any given year. So understanding how benthic organisms respond to ocean acidification and climate change is really important. So, Within the benthic organisms life stage, we have these really cool dynamics that we have to consider. Um, we have to consider two phases, the pelagic phase and the benthic phase. And the pelagic phase within that has two phases. It has the very new hatched larvae, and then it has a competent larvae. And then they start to settle and they'll go to the benthos and you have the juvenile phase where they're not yet reproducing. And then you have the adult phase where you start having reproduction. Each of these phases should be considered or life cycles should be considered separate because how they respond to changes, the abiotic and the biotic factors will be different. And within that, you have not only the abiotic factors and the biotic factors, you also have your maternal effects, your carryover effect, and your transgenerational -gen effects that are going to influence how a benthic organism is going to respond to ocean acidification and any other changes in the environment. So there is a hundred year history of how these organisms respond to temperature and how they respond to salinity. And I think we need to acknowledge that when we're looking at how they're gonna respond to pH changes in ocean acidification, that the literature of how they respond to just temperature or salinity or both of those together is very rich and is almost a hundred years old. If we also look at the biotic factors, for example, how they respond to nutritional quality, the plankton that's in the water column, that is a very rich literature that is extremely old too. 
So when we're thinking about what to monitor and what to go forward with monitoring on the benthic organisms, some of what the data has, institute data we have is new and some of the lab experiments are new. new so we got to keep that in mind. So, and you can see this in this um, synthesis of manuscripts that were published between the year 20, 2000 and 2010, and then 2010 to 2020. And we see the number of manuscripts have increased over the last decade. And most of the manuscripts first started looking at either temperature or away in the early 2000s, and now more of them are looking at OA, either by itself or an OA temperature interaction. Most of these are lab experiments. A lot of them are on benthic invertebrates because um, benthic invertebrates are an important food source, they're economics, they create jobs. A lot of them are on one species and a lot of them are in the lab. What's interesting about this is most of them are on, most of the manuscripts are on the Eastern oyster or uh, gigas. 50% are on larvae, about 50% are on juveniles or adults. But of those manuscripts, only about 4 to 5% actually use in situ values to set their conditions. So they, a lot of people are setting the conditions based on the predictions, and they're not really sure what their organism is being exposed to prior to doing the experiment, which is interesting in itself. And these experimental designs, there's a multiple different ways each laboratory is doing them, but they start off simple with the chemicals being added, three different levels, a lot of them, some of them are two, and looking at how the organism responds. Some of the very first experiments here focused on survival, growth, and development. Um, more recently, as we move forward in the laboratory experiments, we've been focusing on maintenance and energy budget. And if we want to understand how an organism or a population is responding to ocean acidification and which variables are some of the drivers like temperature or food, we need to include um, research in the laboratory that looks at maintenance, looks at how they're feeding, looks at their... Um, catabolic processes like respiration and excretion so that we can feed these into dynamic energy budget models or individual based models that then can be fed into population growth models and community structure models. There has also been some focus in the last decade to start understanding since um, gene expression work has been more cost effective recently and we're starting to get more organisms where the genome is known. There's been looking at how genes are being expressed, upregulated or downregulated, what the cellular processes are, and whether or not we can start to see the genes changing because of ocean acidification or changes in the environment. What's interesting is for some populations, we are already starting to see what would be considered an adaptive evolutionary um, mechanism, and that's rain shift. The fisheries data indicates that some species are starting to move into deeper waters and um, northward. And if you look at manuscripts since 2019, there's only over 17,000 of them on Google Scholar. And most of these have been attributed to temperature because there's a big richness of data available for temperature. And it's one of the abiotic um, factors that's almost always measured for benthic organisms. And when populations start shifting range, it's almost always related to some type of abiotic factor. Um, so I'd like to keep some of that in mind. And so one thing that's unique about the NECAM area is that it's a coastal area, which means it's highly, highly dynamic. And you've got variability with the tides, you've got variability with the season, and you've got variability with river runoffs. So the two inches of rain here a couple of weeks in uh, Connecticut really had our um, carbonate chemistry varying quite a bit. Because it's so dynamic, we need to start looking at non-traditional approaches as we move from the laboratory to the field. This is a nice manuscript by Vargas. And what they did is they looked at all the manuscripts of benthic organisms uh, focused on corals and bivalves um, to look at those that had in situ, in situ measurements 
where the population was grabbed from, and then their exposure. So when they did that, they found when they were exposed to uh, ocean acidifications that were greater than their in situ environment, there always was a negative effect. Most of the literature is um, indicating that benthic organisms, especially bivalves, are showing a negative effect to ocean acidification with changes in um, metabolic processes and changes in um, growth rates and respiration rates and feeding rates. So the laboratory experiments are starting to have demonstrated that we have um, effects on these benthic organisms, but now we need to move into the field because in order for us to start being included in some of these habitat suitability maps for benthic organisms, we need the in-situ data and we need the field observations. So you guys are probably all familiar with the current monitoring stations. I'd like to highlight the two um, purple circles. They are the sites that have benthic water sampling and monitoring sampling at uh, water monitoring sampling at the same time. And then you have fixed scheduled cruises. Some of them occur yearly, one in the spring and one in the fall. Some occur on different time schedules. And with benthic organisms, it's gonna be really important doing that entire water column because they have that pelagic phase. The um, pelagic phase, depending on which organism you're talking about can be short like a surf clam can be in the pelagic phase for 20 days, or if you're talking about a sea scallop, it may be 40 days in the pelagic phase. So how long they're in each of these phases is um, in, in the water column can depend on which organism you're talking about. And then you have the ships of opportunity that give us nice surface uh, in situ data. So what has the in situ data told us about um, the environment that benthic organisms live in. Now I've broken this into three regions, which um, I'm gonna explain why in a little bit. Um, we have Georgia's banks, we have the Gulf of Maine, and we have the Mid-Atlantic Bight. This is a nice paper by Freeland looking at in situ uh, temperature and using models to predict what's on. It does a long-term forecast, which is columns A through C and a short term between D and F. So long-term hit record is 1968 to 2018. Short term is 2004 to 2018. Um, so in the A through C is the spring and D through F is the fall. And what we see is, for example, in the spring, the Gulf of Maine is getting warmer. And in the fall, the Gulf of Maine is getting warmer. But Georgia's bank on the long-term record is kind of not getting warmer in the spring, but it is getting warmer in the fall. So there's seasonal difference. And then if you look at the short-term record, when you get to the mid-Atlantic bite, column C and F, that during the spring, it's actually not getting warmer at all. It might be getting a little cooler, whereas during the fall, it's getting much warmer. And there's a gradient in this region in temperature that they're not all consistently increasing in temperature at the same rate or during the same season. The second thing is that each of these regions are seeing difference changed in an abiotic factor that's important to benthic organisms and that's plankton blooms. For example, the Gulf of Maine and the Mid-Atlantic Bight region is not seeing a change in the timing of the spring or fall bloom, whereas Georgia's Banks is seeing a, a change. And in fact, in the autumn, the duration of the bloom, the start of the bloom is changing so that it's later in the year. And the duration is sh shrinking by about two and a half weeks. And we already know from past literature that food availability is really important. Now, from the mooring data that's in the NECAM region, we are see seeing that there's yearly variability um, with the carbonate chemistry between alkalinity, DIC, pH, and the aragonite and calcite um, saturation state. This is a new paper that came out in 2022, and that it's seasonal, that the highest aragonite saturation state is occurring during the summer. 
which is also when most benthic organisms spawn and that the larvae would be in the water columns. So that is a, since this is a buoy, that's a very interesting finding that when the larvae are in the water column, which the data suggests are um, really sensitive to ocean acidification, that the aragonite saturation state is actually higher. So the seasonality data is really good because it provides us information of what's going on that we can then take back into the laboratory and time um, when spawning events would occur to what the carbonate chemistry is. And then all of that data is used to make these nice models um, that show what current conditions are. And as we move forward in the future, the conditions are gonna get more acidic for the region. But the one thing I would recommend going forward with benthic organisms is we need to treat them as three distinct regions. I've just shown that the in situ um, measurements have already shown that the Mid-Atlantic by Georgia's Banks and the Gulf of Maine are behaving differently um, based on temperature and based on food availability. We already know from over a 50 year review of literature that benthic organisms respond to temperature and respond to food availability and it's an important driver. And so since these regions are behaving differently, we need to start treating them as separate entities for benthic organisms, which if we look at the legend of where the buoys and monitoring stations are right now, we don't have a great representation of the lower part of the NECAM region by Long Island Sound. We have very little by Georgia's bank and we have more on the coastal region of the Gulf of Maine. The other reason I think we need to treat these differently with respect to acidification is the, for biological um, conductivity, it is the literature, the e ecological literature suggests that there is not a lot of larval transport between these regions. So in order to understand what's going on with benthic organisms in each region, they have to be separated into three distinct marine regions. That would be my first recommendation. And because in the end, I think we all want to get to these habitat, habitat suitability maps that include ocean acidification. This is a map that looked at uh, temperature and the first column, C, D, and E, and these are all considered benthic organisms. And when they had one variable, uh, they ended up getting a much different habitat suitability versus when they started adding complexity. And they were able to better um, predict what habitat was suitable when they added more complexity. If we look at benthic habitats for bivalve communities in general, there is a richness of literature that goes back to the 90s that says bivalves will reject, sedim sedim will reject settling at the sediment water interface if the conditions are not right, they are being able to uh, sense the environment. And if they do not like the environment, they will not settle there. This has been shown to um, be related to um, the uh, abundance in the sediments and, and has also been able to um, been related to dissolution. Mark Green did some of that work, uh, Clements did some of that work, and we did some looking at community abundance in Long Island Sound based on sediment water chemistry. So we know that bivalves will reject or accept an environment for settlement based on the carbonate chemistry based from this literature, but we haven't made it to the point of being able to include it into these habitat suitability maps because there's very few fields um, set of field examples or field experiments, even though the laboratory experiments have already said that these are really important, we need more field experiments that confirm what we're observing in the laboratory. So I'm moving in another direction of where I think we need to see to look at, and that's looking at genetics and looking at um, the spatial genomic structures of organisms. For example, this manuscript just came out and it looks at, there's two, considered two uh, genomic uh, structures of sea scallops. There's a north population and a south population. This manuscript looked at in situ environmental parameters that were available. Those parameters that were available were chlorophyll, 
temperature uh, and nutrients, nitrogen. Um, it looked at ammonia, sulfate, nitrate, and I think silica. And what it ended up finding was that there was a difference in how the each population of uh, sea scallops responded to the environmental parameters. And as they included oceanographic variability, Ability, they saw the populations pull apart slightly. So if we're trying to answer the question of whether or not species have the ability, are species adapting and do they have the ability to adapt to ch climate change and ocean acidification, we need to be able to start to tease some of this apart by including ocean acidification measurements in some of these analysis that can be done. Cod, for example, has three distinct populations Things that have distinct populations like the sea scalp and the cod are considered um, genetically strong because they can have the ability to adapt and it might be a genetic adaptation in addition to range shifts. So understanding and adding that benthic component, um, that genetic component to the benthic component in the field is something that we need to move forward with. Something like the American lobster, though, is completely different. The American lobster, the genotype is considered weak, meaning that there is no difference between a northern and a southern population, that it's very similar. And so that their response may just be a range shift. We need to start to validate that and make sure we're seeing that also in the field along with the laboratory experiments. And what I think we're all hoping for in the end as we move from benthic organisms to recommendations uh, with respect to acidification is something like this that's coming up in the State of the Ecosystem Report for 2023. And this image is from Grace uh, Saba. She's compiled all of the data from cruises and it's only of the summer looking at bottom aragonite saturation state from the uh, fixed buoys, the glider data, and what she's generated here is basically areas that are already experiencing concentration levels with respect to aragonite saturation state that are no longer suitable habitats for cod and the American lobster. And as we get more and more data, we should be able to fill in some of these gaps so that we can start including ocean acidification in part of the habitat suitability reports. So let's go back to the benthic organism life stage. I measure it all. <laughs> I think you wanted a little more definition, but I think we need to make sure that we're adding more um, in-situ measurements and we're doing field experiments. We have to start moving from the lab to the field to see what's going on. It's difficult to do and I realize that, but there are so many things that are intertwined intercombined with temperature and salinity and uh, carbonate chemistry and the nutrients that in order to tease some of this apart, we need the laboratory experiments, but we also need to move into the field to see what's going on. And I'm going to use the surf clam as an example because the manuscripts have shown that and data has indicated that the Atlantic surf clams are moving offshore into deeper, colder waters. Uh, Amelia Poos, who was a postdoc here at the Milford Lab, did a dynamic energy budget model on the surf clam. He had physiological rates, and he found that carbonate chemistry ended up causing those rates to change. So how they assimilated food, how they respired, and how they excreted changed based on carbon dioxide, which allowed him to treat carbon dioxide as a main driving variable. What's interesting about this work is when he put it in a model, he found that a slight increase in temperature should actually cause them to grow slightly faster depending on which region they were in. But, and he saw a difference in growth by the year 2080 in, in the region he chose within the Mid-Atlantic Bight. But what was interesting is the reproductive output. He found that the first thing that was affected 60 years before he saw differences in, um, in growth was reproduction. 
The number of studies that look at reproduction from the minute a larvae is born to the minute it, it starts reproducing, you don't get studies that long. You get studies that look at short, they take them from the wild where the gonad has already started to be developed. They condition them in the lab and then they're doing crop, they're trying to see if those larvae are more uh, competent by exposing the adults to some OA. But those experiments, the gonads have already started to develop. He, th the model suggests that gonad development and potentially um, recruitment would be affected based on OA first before we would see changes in growth. Not only that, the surf clam has already started to see a um, shift in range. Um, there's been data from NOAA Fisheries that has shown this. And recently, Matt Hare released a uh, document that shows that there's two popular, they are Atlantic surf clams, the uh, Solidissima spicula spicula, but uh, they're Atlantic surf clams and they are not the similar species. And um, what he has found is that there are two genetically distinct populations and these populations seem to be growing different and they're living in the same exact location, potentially responding to environmental variabilities differently. But we don't measure what's going on with the environment in these locations. So we just know based on the growth data that they're growing differently, even though they are in the same location. So why? Um, and if we had field sites located here, we could see if adaptation is occurring, if we are having evolution occur in the field. What's also interesting is if you look at the 1980 um, growth parameters for the Atlantic surf clams and look at the 2007 to 2012 growth parameters, they are decreasing. So they are growing slower in locations up and down the east uh, coast. So something is going on with the Atlantic surf clam and it's probably a combination of changes going on abiotic and biotic. But right now to say which parameter it is because we have a hundred years worth of data on temperature, that is what it's being attributed to. But if we had more data on the food and we had more data on the um, ocean uh, carbonate chemistry, we could be able to tease this apart with field data and um, laboratory experiments. So my recommendation is that we treat each of the even NECAM as three um, separate entities where we had field locations in each of them. And we can look at climate factor changes over time in uh, the laboratory. We can also see from the um, fisheries um, assessment whether or not um, species are migrating. But in order to really see if uh, evolution is occurring, we need to do multiple, genera multiple generation experiments on a single population. And by identifying field sites to do this, we can measure across the space-time continuum and look at plasticity. We can take organisms from that area and test things in the lab to see what the main driver, because the main drivers in the Mid-Atlantic Bight may not be the main drivers in the Gulf of Maine. And we can look also if different, if, um, if there's a difference in plasticity between sex, and, and we can look also at the nature of the plasticity itself by having these field locations and going from the field to the lab. So some of the technologies I'd recommend is probably underwater vehicles, uh, imaging, acoustic 3D mapping, taking cameras. Do we need to do something like a free ocean CO2 enrichment experiment for some of these sensitive benthic organisms? Um, do we try to do something in the water column with the larvae at different depths to see how larvae respond to different depths and food availability? Um, moving these new technologies into the field environment will help us really start to understand and tease apart which biotic and abiotic factor is driving what we're seeing with the benthic community going on. Um, 
And always when we do this, it's gonna be observations on multiple temporal time scales. So we need the laboratory studies, which remember about 4% are based on actual institute data. We need to look at uh, re respiration rate, feeding rates. We need to get those initial rates so we can feed them into models. So we can actually look at other variables that we should be looking at. We need to also look at genetics to see if the genetics are changing and what the major players are. The models and the laboratory studies can help feed into the field sampling and the field sampling can help us test a certain hypothesis that the laboratory experiments are start suggesting are going on. We can look for inconsistencies between the two. Developing the models is a really important time, uh, component and getting time series of multiple measurements. Um, this one's just of temperature here to show the long history that we have and why a lot of times habitat mats right now aren't including acidification, even though benthic organisms have been shown to be sensitive to it because of the short time series that we have. And looking at the proxy from archive shells, what information can we get from the past shells? If we're already seeing differences in growth parameters for surf plants, can we get some information from past sea scallop shells? Can we get from some information from past ocean quahog cells? I mean, ocean quahogs can live to be up to 200 years. Their shell may have a lot of information in it that we can get um, that can be used to help guide some of these laboratory and field experiments and help us pick locations for field um, time series. And that is all that I have. Thanks so much, Shannon. That was awesome. Um, next up, we're going to hear from Justin Reese. Justin is a professor of marine and environmental sciences at Northeastern University in Boston. His research investigates how ocean warming and acidification affects marine calcifying organisms, as well as how geochemical signatures within shells and skeletons of marine organisms can be used to reconstruct past ocean conditions. At Northeastern, he teaches courses in oceanography and global oceanic change and serves on the steering committee of NECAN. He resides with his wife and three kids in Swampscott, Massachusetts, on the North Shore of Boston. So please take it away, Justin. Justin. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for that intro, Austin. And um, yeah, thanks for that great presentation, Shannon. Um, did we want to take time for questions just while it's on people's minds uh, from the previous speaker? I believe. So we usually do the question period at the end all together and let the uh, the steering committee ask kind of the panel as a whole some questions. Okay. Now, Shannon raised uh, uh, really interesting uh, points. I'm glad I didn't focus on the too much on the biological side because it would have been inadequate compared to what Shannon presented. Um, so I, I'm going to take a slightly different approach. I'm going to talk a little bit about my own research, just to kind of give you a context of why, where I'm coming from, and then talk about uh, some of the broader literature in just variability in coastal environments and marginal marine environments, and how that I think that informs, you know, some of the research priorities that we should engage in uh, through NECAN. All right, so I'll just... Um... All right, so this, this is a figure everybody's seen. You know, this is the history of CO2 over the last million years, fluctuating between two and 300 ppm, mainly driven by glacial cycles and freezing and thawing of permafrost, starting and shutting down the uh, global uh, carbon cycle in soils. And then, of course, humans come onto the scene, starts to build, <clears throat> start to um, 
industrialize, extract fossil fuels, you know, take all that carbon out of the, the slow cycle and the geological record, release it to the fast cycles in the upper ocean and atmosphere. And then, you know, the predictions over the next century. Um, you know, I know there's variability in, in what those expectations are, but we're talking, you know, an order man, a general uh, threefold increase from pre-industrial levels. So uh, I guess you're kind of wondering why am I why am I showing this figure? Everybody knows this figure. Um, this figure actually I think is is problematic for OA research um, because it provides uh, you know false sense of, of what the range of PCO2 conditions we should be concerned about in the marginal marine environments where where most calcifying organisms live. And this is mainly focused on. Uh, Acidification impacts on acidification, not so much warming, just because I, it's, it's tailored to NECAN, uh, focused on acidification. So, you know, we're not talking about up to, you know, 900 p ppm CO2 in these environments over the next century. Uh, we're talking about conditions that, um, you know, go all the way up to 3,000, 4,000 ppm even today, just on seasonal and diurnal cycles. And then you're layering on top of that. The anthropogenic effects. Uh, so, you know, the, the follow up to that, these are, you know, predictions based on open ocean conditions, you know, the range IPCC scenarios, predicting undersaturation for aragonite by 2070, calcite about 2150 if you extrapolate. But again, this is open ocean conditions, surface water conditions, uh, the environments where a lot of the organisms that are more vulnerable to acidification like estuaries and shelf environments are going are gonna to see undersaturation much earlier. Many of these are already undersaturated uh, today. So some of the, you know, some of the early work, initial studies that came out um, you know, with the pteropods and you know, in the, in the mid-2000s, a lot of these were done with uh, hydrochloric acid and you know, demonstrated the negative effects of acidification without uh, including the effects of elevated DIC, which in some in some situations for some organisms uh, can mitigate the effects of acidification if carbon is limiting for their calcification. So these initial experiments, which is hydrochloric acid, were very extreme. Um, one of the first things I set out to do as a postdoc at, at Huey was a, to do a set of experiments on a wide range of species. Uh, I'm trained as a geologist, so I always take a polyphyletic approach to looking at trends, looking at different polymorph mineralogies of organisms, different taxonomic groups, look for broad trends, more like you know, doing an assessment in the in the uh, fossil record rather than focusing in on um, a narrow group of species. So we looked at 18 different species that spanned a broad range of taxonomic groups, limpets, urchins, crustaceans, calcifying green algae, coral and red algae, various species of mollusks, gastropods, circulate worms, crabs, lobsters, shrimps, various species of corals, <clears throat> and did a, you know, pretty, um, I mean, at the time it was adventurous because it was one of the first OA experiments that had been done, but now we've kind of moved beyond the, the laboratory setting. We need, to, like Shannon mentioned, we really need to ground treat these results in the field, but the initial experiments were done in a in an ocean acidification array, controlling temperature, PCO2, and just looking at the effects on calcification rate. <clears throat> and you know, for example, we we saw a lot of negative trends. Looking at whelks, for example, uh, at, at four CO2 levels, we grew the organisms at 400, 600, 900, and about 3,000 ppm. They're going pretty far out into the future. Uh, resulting in saturation states from about two and a half all the way down to undersaturated around 0.7. Calcification rates for most of the organisms showed a pretty uh, the expected decline. Um, beyond the the calcification rates, uh, we saw impacts on functional morphology that were pretty interesting. For instance, the whelk has uses a series of longitudinal and orbital ridges to buttress their skeletons. They can increase the strength without having to thicken the entire shell like a buttress on a building. Uh, in the high CO2 conditions, you know, that high surface area to volume ratio causes those, those features to, 
preferentially dissolve away. So it, you know, acidification not only causes the calcification rates to slow, but also compromises uh, the functional morphology of the organism, some of the evolutionary tricks that those organisms have evolved to strengthen their shell without having to increase the mass. And saw this also in bivalves with their, with their ridges. Let's see those ridges well formed under high CO2 almost non-existent, uh, well-formed under low CO2, almost non-existent under high CO2. Bottom of the shell, uh, literally, you know, rubbing away as it scrapes along the bottom of the tank, layer by layer. And the reason, you know, when you bore in a little closer and look at, use the electron microscope, um, you know, what you see is this well, as an example, produces a bimineralic skeleton, a layer of aragonite, layer of calcite, and it, it does that kind of like the same reasons that we use multiple with different materials for bulletproof vests, for example. We want to stop, stop crack propagation by you know, breaking up cleavage planes between adjacent crystals. So if you have two polymorphs of, of calcium carbonate, aragonite, and calcite, it's harder for a force to propagate along a single plane through those two layers. Uh, the downside of that is they produce aragonite and calcite, and the aragonite is more soluble than the calcite. So under the high CO2 conditions, the aragonite preferentially dissolves away. So you end up with basically every other layer of that whelk shell uh, removed. Do XRD on the shells and you can see it very clearly. The proportion of calcite uh, almost doubles in the high CO2 condition, not because it's easier for them to form calcite, just because of the a lot of the aragonite is, is preferentially dissolving away. And then when you do uh, load testing on those shells cultured under the four CO2 conditions, you can see what the effects of, of removing that aragonite, preferentially removing or reducing that aragonite layer is. Under uh, normal CO2 conditions, they can withstand a force of about 1.4 kilonewtons, and that drops by about 60 to 70 percent under the high CO2 conditions uh, when they lose that, uh, the aragonite layer. That was just an example of kind of the ways we um, you know, probe the impacts of acidification on, on shells. Uh, another aspect of the study that was interesting, you know, we saw these negative trends, um, but the, those negative trends were strongest in bivalves uh, and mollusks. Uh, there's a couple species, uh, well, one species uh, of mollusk, the, the limpet, actually showed this surprising parabolic trend where moderate acidification actually enhanced calcification. And only once you get up, got up beyond the 900 ppm level did acidification rates begin to decline. And we also saw that um, very frequently for organisms that utilize calcifiers that utilize photosynthesis, suggesting that there's some element of alleviating carbon limitation under higher CO2 conditions for photosynthetic calcifiers like uh, calcifying green algae like halomita, coralline red algae, the major sediment producers in carbon and bank environments, as well as for uh, zooxanthellate corals. We did similar experiments on azoxanthellate corals and they don't have any of this parabolic shape. It's purely negative. There's no benefit to them through their symbionts. Did similar experiments on corals that had bleached their symbionts, and that parabolic response turned negative. So it's really the, the photosynthesis, which is allowing them to you know, mitigate the effects of acidification at low to moderate CO2, but uh, not at high CO2. And the limpets still haven't figured out what they're doing, but they uh, seem to have they seem to be able to, to utilize that elevated carbon up to a point, but then the, in, the insults of dissolution outweigh the benefits of enhanced calcification at about 1,000 ppm. And then surprisingly for the three species of crustacean we looked at, the blue crab, lobster, and, and shrimp, all in the juvenile stage, all showed a positive response to, calc to uh, CO2-induced acidification, all the way up to 3,000 ppm. That was interesting as well. But again, these are molting organisms. They have to calcify, they have to mobilize uh, carbonate and calcium ions within a few hours or else they're just lunch because they're going to self-bodied amidst a world of um, hard-bodied organisms that are, that are ready to prey upon them. So it's likely that they evolved uh, very efficient mechanisms for uh, concentrating carbonate. And we know they have a mechanism for concentrating calcium uh, during their molting phase. And it uh, appears that their that process is carbon limited and able to convert all that extra carbon you give them 
uh, into the into the molting process. All right, so that's my perspective. You know, kind of, that, that was the early work that I did on on acidification research. The one thing that came out of every study I ever did was uh, during the review process, I it, almost every reviewer always said, well, "Why did you look at three thousand ppm?" You know, all their trends are basically controlled by those high CO2, that high CO2 treatment. We're never gonna to get to 3000 PPM, um, no matter how bad things get with fossil fuel emissions. And it's all based on that open ocean scenario and the global mean atmospheric CO2. And every time I have to go through the review process, I have to you know, cite all these papers, Hood Canal, Chesapeake Bay, Long Island Sound, talking about um, the, the, we're already at 3000 PPM. Uh, in these environments on a seasonal basis, independent of anthropogenic CO2 emissions. It is related to human activity due to um, eutrophication, uh, but you know these are conditions that these organisms are already facing, and that's why we test them in the lab under these conditions, you know, not, not the open ocean conditions. So some of the, I uh, think it would be good to kind of really kind of look at some of this variability that's been demonstrated. Um, this isn't the kind of work that I do, but um, Dick Feely, uh, Wei Jun Kai, um, Wallace, you know, there's been a lot of seminal papers published uh, on documenting the extreme variability in these estuarine environments. Uh, for example, you know, one of the first studies, uh, well, probably one of the most uh, well known studies, not the first, uh, by Feely in 2010, looked basically did a transect along the Juan de Fuca Strait and went up several arms uh, in, in the Puget Sound Salish Sea area. This particular transect on the right is just up Juan de Fuca Strait and the, the Hood Canal. So left to right is open ocean, Juan de Fuca Strait, Hood Canal. And you can see that pH um, you know, in the Juan de Fuca Straits up around near seawater conditions, open ocean conditions, 7.8. And by the time you get up into the Hood Canal, you're down to about 7.5. Saturation states around one, and then moving up all the way down to, to 0 0.6, even in, in near surface waters of the Hood Canal. So way undersaturated, uh, much higher than the 3,000 ppm CO2 conditions in that, in that experiment. <clears throat> uh, Kai and I published a kind of a review paper about all these, a lot of these estuarine studies. And they took those observations and kind of projected them into future CO2 scenario, scenarios to try to translate how that, um, that natural variability seasonally and spatially in these estuarine environments, how that's going to change uh, over the next 100 years or so. In that, he, he has this nice diagram, uh, which kind of summarizes a lot of the drivers of this spatial and temporal variability in carbonate chemistry in estuaries. Uh, the big one, of course, is eutrophication, putting nutrients into those waters, you know, fueling algal blooms, you know, then settle out, uh, get remineralized to CO2, driving down CO2 and sat driving up CO, dissolved CO2, driving down pH and saturation state. Uh, other processes are at play. Um, the export of dissolved inorganic carbon from mar mar marshes uh, during tidal cycles, precipitation of calcium carbonate, uh, releases CO2 as well. Of course, you can have dissolution, um, you know, working in the opposite direction. Um, so those two, I don't think, are a huge contributor. I think most of it is eutrophication and then um, input of DIC from essentially you know, terrestrial environments like marshes and um, and river sheds, uh, water watersheds. Uh, these systems are also. Um, you know, have lower salinity, have lower alkalinity, and therefore uh, less buffered, and our and the carbonate system is more, more vulnerable to um, addition of DIC in terms of impacts on the carbonate saturation state. Uh, so Wallace and all did some work um, in three coastal environments, really two, Long Island Sound and, and an adjacent bay, in Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island. I won't spend too much time going through these, but just kind of want to paint a picture 
uh, of what they saw in Long, Long Island Sound. Uh, let's focus, just for the sake of time, ooh, 220, um, on, on the third column here, PCO2. So moving through the summer, July, August, September, October. Unfortunately, he's got these temperature contours, which are a little confusing here, but just look at the color coding. The red is basically undersaturated conditions. And you can see that you know, a large portion of Long Island Sound actually moves into undersaturated conditions in the late summer and early fall due to that remineralization of, of uh, organic carbon. A similar thing seen in Narragansett Bay. Saturation states ranging from, uh, or PCO2, uh, ranging from all the way up to above 2,500 uh, in the uh, the deeper portions. This is the, the northern section. This is the southern section of Narragansett Bay. <laughs> Saturation states on the right column here, uh, ranging from about two all the way uh, down to less, less than 0.5 uh, in, the, in those northern sections. Uh, Chesapeake Bay, uh, similar things observed. It's a lot of data here, but let's focus on this row here, just saturation states. Ignore this here. This is the change in, in saturation state. This is when the study was done. I think this, I can't see the top of the figure in my Zoom screen, but I think this is 2050. Uh, the green basically represents saturation state of one. So everything to the left of the green is undersaturated. You go down all the way to saturation states 0.2 to 0.3 in the northern sections of the bay, even in, in the surface waters. Uh, down in Virginia and you know central portions of the Maryland par portion of Chesapeake Bay, surface waters are oversaturated. But moving north, and there's calcifiers up here as well. Uh, you're in undersaturated conditions. Kind of did the same thing for the Puget Sound study. Took the uh, you know, present day observations, uh, predicted them into the future with models, and showed that yes, you've got a, a large amount of variability uh, in Puget Sound. You you're already in undersaturated conditions, and anthropogenic CO2 is only going to make those undersaturated conditions more undersaturated. We did little work on this. Just wanted to talk about it's unpublished, so don't send these figures around, but I, I wanted to talk about them. Uh, my student, Lise McNally, did, did a great job um, collecting a, this data and, and interpreting them. Uh, one thing we saw was a, a clear relationship between salinity and alkalinity in Bar Barnstable Harbor and our two sites in Ipswich River, a um, uh, basically a upriver site, which is mostly fresh, and then a, a site that was dominated by tides. So you have this relationship between salinity and alkalinity. Um, you know, if you're in a system where, where it's controlled mainly by mixing, those those relationships can hold, and you can sometimes even use salinity as a proxy for alkalinity, which is something we we've got to think about doing until we can build low cost alkalinity titration systems that are stable and, and can be deployed, you know, into these environments. Uh, but every every base and every tidal system really you have to work out that relationship empirically before you can start to do it. Uh, so we also had loggers in these systems uh, for a couple of years. Uh, we we were using using those salinity alkalinity relationships to infer alkalinity from the salinity data, and then we were using um, uh, combining that with the pH data from the loggers, and then calculating carbonate system parameters. From that inferred alkalinity and pH, and um, saw some cool stuff. Um, saw a lot of variability in the Ipswich River system. Um, saw not only throughout the tidal cycle but also throughout the season. So the red data for Barnstable Harbor, um, not nothing too surprising in that environment. But the Ipswich River, that's got a strong tidal component. Uh, we saw major changes in saturation state between high tide. Low tide, which is a negative six, positive six value broken down by season. You now going from um, in the winter, oversaturated to very un highly undersaturated. Uh, in the fall, in those systems during high tide, um, saturation states were all the way up around four in that same day. 
uh, saturation states drop below one. So just within a single day, fluctuations in saturation state, right over the oyster reefs, right over the clam beds, saturation states four to undersaturated. So a lot, not only variability geographically and with depth, like Kai and Philly and Wallace and all these groups have shown, but also throughout the tidal cycle through time, the same spot. A little bit behind here, four minutes, okay. Uh, so we did another study in Georgia's bank. Everybody knows the scallop beds out on Georgia's bank. We wanted to, to sample the water at these scallop beds because we we're noticing the, the scallop shells that were coming up from these environments were different. Some were really chalky, showed evidence of dissolution. Other sites, they were well-formed, ridges preserved, no evidence of dissolution. We went out over, over the bank with a scallop vessel. This is work done through the scallop RSA. And we took bottle samples right above the, the scallop beds where they're you know, thriving. Uh, closed sites, most of them. And so again, a huge range in saturation state. Uh, some of these beds, saturation states up around six, uh, some in the mid twos to threes, and some around one, even undersaturated. And these are all scallop beds, uh, productive scallop beds. So they're, they're surviving in these conditions, even in the undersaturated conditions, uh, probably because there's tons of food out there. And they have a lot of energy for manipulating you know, the, the carbonic chemistry within their, then the fluid, the extrapolar fluid that they form their shells from. But they, they're having to work harder and the meat in these, these, these shells are, are smaller. And the shells are literally um, chalky. You know, they are, the outer layer is completely dissolved. They've got no uh, texture. Um, but what this allows it to do is to take these in situ measurements of carbonic chemistry at these different uh, scallop beds and then compare the saturation state in those waters uh, to properties of the shell that we could measure. Uh, so for example, we looked at the tissue condition uh, of the scallops uh, from all these different sites and then plotting saturation state, you see a clear decline in, in tissue quality as the saturation state of their location on Georgia's bank decreases. So a similar decline in gonadosomatic in, somatic index, quality of the gonad tissue also declining, even a change in the arrangement of the calcite crystals in their shell. As saturation state decreased across the bank, uh, crystal, uh, uh, crystal density increased. That little counterintuitive means the crystals get bigger, but there's fewer of them. And uh, when we did the testing with uh, Instron, uh, we saw an inverse relationship. Uh, we saw, no, we saw a, a linear relationship between crystal density and the amount of force they could withstand. So the lower the crystal density, the larger the crystals, the more easily fractured those, those scallop shells were. So the less resistant they'd be to predators like uh, lobsters or jawed fish or other crushing, crushing predators. Uh, and then we actually modeled the, the growth rates because we, we got... Uh, like Shannon mentioned, we you know you can look at uh, growth layers in the shell and age age the scallops, and uh, allowed us to develop growth histories for uh, for all the shells that we extracted across Georgia's bank, and then we modeled under saturation states of about 0.9 uh, versus six what the uh, growth in increase in shell height is as a function of age. And you can see for the, the undersaturated sites on Georgia's bank, they don't reach a harvestable, har harvestable size until about three years. For the uh, higher saturation state uh, sites on Georgia's bank, they reach a harvestable size at about 1.8 years. So it's about 50% faster, uh, shorter time to reach harvestable size uh, if, they're, if they're growing in a pocket of Georgia's bank that has favorable saturation states. Um, there's a whole uh, world we're about to embark on here with uh, carbon drawdown, ocean alkalinity enhancement experiments are already underway. Um, you know, reacting silicate rocks like olivine and basalt, uh, adding alkalinity to seawater, dissolving calcium carbonate, kind of, you know, amplifying that natural pathway in the Earth's chemostat that naturally offsets acidification. Um, like it or hate it, the work is underway. Um, there's a recent article in uh, 
in science um, about an experiment, an alkaline, alkalinity enhancement experiment that's starting, I think, on the Gulf Coast of Florida in an estuary. Uh, rhodamine dye here to track the, the alkalinity uh, uh, dispersion. Um, you know, for these types of experiments, most of them are going to be done and are being done in estuaries and, and coastal environments, partly because uh, just out of convenience, and that's the places that we can monitor most efficient, efficiently. So for these types of experiments, we really need the ability to understand the natural variability in carbonic chemistry in these systems, and ideally have a network of, of sensors in some of these key environments, Long Island Sound, Chesapeake Bay, Narragansett Bay, Hood River. Um, I know they're not all under the purview of, of NECAN, but these are the systems where a lot of the experimental work is going to be done. It's going to benefit from the ability to, to measure these parameters. This is um, some data that came out of an alkalinity uh, enhancement experiment, you know, showing baseline alkalinity in the upper left, and then the alkalinity after the addition of, um, I think, calcium hydroxide or soda ash or some, some alkaline mineral, uh, resulting pH, DIC drawdown, and then this experiment was looking at the impacts on uh, phytoplankton, I believe, in that environment. But the, the take-home message is there's a, there's a whole world of alkaline enhancement that's, uh, that's starting in these estuarine environments. And we really need a better understanding of the natural variability and to have a, a network in place to easily measure what's going on and not rely on these practitioners to build that network, which, which they're probably not gonna do. So this kind of summarizes just some of the points I brought up. You know, estuaries, marginal marine environments are particularly vulnerable to OA because of the factors we talked about and everyone knows about. Eutrophication, low buffering capacity, low salinity, DIC flux from marshes, other stressors. Th these environments are also where so many of the benthic calcifiers live and, and most of the commercially important benthic calcifiers live. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, and we'll probably first, you know, see the first effects and already seeing the first effects of acidification in these systems on those calcif uh, calcifiers. Uh, there's a new generation of alkalinity enhancement field trials that are, that are underway and will be underway in the next few years. Uh, and those combined with the, the field-based acidification studies that we should also be doing really would benefit from, um, you know, networks of sensors. Uh, that make direct measurements of, of pH, pCO2, alkalinity, and DIC. Another issue that's more challenging, um, you know, for estuary environments is that because of these diurnal fluctuations in, in DIC, and, you know, which can be so extreme coming off the marsh and experiments where you're adding alkalinity to seawater over short periods of time, the carbon systems are, are out of chemical equilibrium. So you can't use equilibrium coefficients to calculate the carbon parameters. The whole community is dependent on equilibrium um, assumptions for um, association reactions in the carbonate system. Uh, and that's all been kind of codified in CO2 cis. Um, not, not everybody uses it, but CO2 cis really was revolutionary for OA research because it let, you know, let people without uh, you know, the ability to do these calculations uh, from scratch, uh, it gave them access to this. So we really need a, a kind of a, a system for you know, making non-equilibrium calculations for the carbonate system uh, based on measurements that are easy to make, like pH and pCO2, um, where you, you, you can't rely on assumptions of equilibrium. So something which kind of brings a, you know, the USGS freak, uh, freak C approach to non-equilibrium you know, kinetic-based calculations to make a, a user-friendly interface for the research community. So that's just my two cents on subjects. Thanks, thanks for the invitation to speak, and uh, happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you so much, Justin. Uh, up next, we will be hearing from Christopher Algar. And before Chris goes, uh, I just want to uh, make it. I just want to have a little caveat that this presentation was originally going to be in April, but due to a scheduling conflict, it got moved down to today. So it fits in a little bit better with our OA and climate webinar, uh, but we're happy to have Chris here today to uh, give the presentation. Uh, and Chris is an associate professor in the oceanography department at Dalhousie University uh, with an interest in sediment bio 
geochemistry and the microbial ecosystems that catalyze many of these processes. His research approach combines field observations with reactive transport modeling to investigate the coupled cycling of oxygen, carbon, and nutrients between sediment and overlaying water. Thanks, Chris. You can share your slides now. All right. Um, okay. It just said that Justin has to stop sharing for me to share. Oh. I think so. There you go. It should be good, Chris. Great, thanks. And I'll just get this playing here. There we go. All right, well, thank you very much for giving me a second chance to come and speak to you all today. Again, my apologies for not being able to uh, talk to you in my original slot, but very happy to still be here and talking to everyone. So, and I'll be talking today, I guess, sort of maybe give an example of one way and I've been attempting to monitor sediment impacts, um, sediment biogeochemical process and how they affect carbonate chemistry in the overlying water. I mean, I will add a caveat that I haven't done a lot of work, I'd say my in directly in OA or ocean acidification, but a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the processes I study in the sediments do have direct implications. So I'm happy to, happy to share my perspective with you today. So um, if I can get my pointer up here. Um, so this is my little kind of cartoon I drew um, just representing the coupling of the water column with uh, sediment biogeochemical processes. So here we have um, these little green dots of my, my best artistic impression of phytoplankton sinking through the water column and organic carbon accumulating on the seafloor. Once it accumulates, um, it drives these heterotrophic um, benthic communities, you know, benthic infauna, but also very often microbial dominated communities that break down this organic matter, remineralize it, and return um, dissolved inorganic carbon to the overlying water. Uh, if this occurs aerobically, it's primarily returning DIC, but if this, um, breakdown of organic matter occurs anaerobically below the depth of oxygen penetration, not only does it return DIC, but it also produces alkalinity, which can also be returned to the overlying water column. So um, this balance between DIC and alkalinity can then affect the, um, have an impact on the um, overlying water's buffering capacity and how it might respond to changes in that sort of larger long-term change in, uh, in ocean acidification. Um, if we look at maybe these pH profiles um, in the water column, um, the result of remineralization organic matter um, results in a decrease in, um, in pH um, as you go down through the, through the water column. Um, I think this little increase again near the bottom of this particular profile was from um, advective processes. Um, um, so this is, in, this is in the water. We do see a little decrease in pH with depth, but if we look at the sediments, um, we see a much more dramatic decrease in pH. In this case, um, about almost, um, you know, within the sediment, getting close to almost three quarters of a pH unit within the top uh, centimeter, centimeter or so. Um, so just to point out the scales on these two slides. So one thing, this pH profile, which was measured with a CTD, and the sediment profile, which was measured with a microsensor, were taken at the same point and location in time in the sediment, in, in the water column. So pH through, this, through the water column into the sediment. And notice that the scales are different. This is in meters, this is in centimeters. So a very dramatic you know, change in pH in the top centimeter of the sediments and this very strong, um, strong gradient. This increase in pore water pH, I think can also, another main way it can influence um, bottom water chemistry is by driving the dissolution of calcium carbonate, despite the fact that the overlying water may still be, uh, be super saturated. Um, and this in turn can again um, drive a release of alkalinity into the overlying water column. So I think, you know, when we're in the, you know, when you're in the deep ocean, um, this balance between respiration and um, 
aerobic anaerobic respiration isn't you know at least on human time scales that much of a concern because you know you're in deep water um most of the organic carbon remineralization is occurring in the water column but when we're in these coastal shelf and coastal environments with shallow water higher primary productivity a much greater portion of the remineralization is occurring in the sediments and considering this balance between DIC and alkalinity release is probably you know is much more important in understanding the carbonate system dynamics of the uh, um, carbonate system chemistry of the system on um, on these sort of short term human um, human time scales. Um, and then just to you know maybe give a bit more of an example on how complicated the situation in um, sediments are. I'm not going to go into this slide in any kind of detail, but this is um, from um, uh, Carolyn Sotart's paper in 2007, just listing all the reactions in a typical coastal sediment that can influence um, alkalinity fluxes from the sediment. And I think this gets across the, uh, the point that there is, um, is quite a lot of them. So these first ones are those primary redox um, redox reactions driving remineralization of organic matter. Um, these generally, if they occur aerobically, they generally occur with very little alkalinity production. But if they, um, if they occur anaerobically, then you get this generation of alkalinity. Just to explain this a little bit, this, this column here on the right shows the typical alkalinity change that can be expected from uh, one of these one of these reactions with these gammas being the C to N ratio of nitrogen and phosphate in the organic matter. The second group of reactions down here are the secondary reoxidation reactions. So the reoxidation of the byproducts of anaerobic metabolism. And these generally as a rule, except in a few cases, um, consume alkalinity. So essentially undo that alkalinity production by the anaerobic um, respiration processes associated with the breakdown of organic matter. And then in the final section of reactions are all of these precipitation or dissolution reactions or reactions with the mineral phases, solid grains in the sediment pore water. And depending on the particular reaction and pH in the pore water, these can either produce or consume alkalinity. So when you're considering the final you know, product of the alkalinity flux from the sediment, it's really due to the combination of how these you know, huge collection of reactions interact, um, interact with each other. And that will produce the, frat, you know, the, the ratio of alkalinity to DIC flux uh, from the sediments um, and impacting the, uh, the bottom water chemistry. Um, so then to give a maybe a um, example of how um, I'm, uh, I'm thinking about this and sort of quantifying this, I'm just going to give maybe a little bit of case study of what we are doing here in Halifax to, um, to, um, to understand, um, I guess, um, ocean acidification in our own backyard and how I'm thinking about how we should think about incorporating an understanding of sediment dynamics into this. So most of what I'm going to show in this example is based on this Bedford Basin monitoring program. So Bedford Basin, um, right here, and this is a map of Nova Scotia. This is Halifax, Nova Scotia, where I am. Um, I guess I'm sitting right here, which is about where Dalhousie University is located on this map. And Bedford Basin is the innermost portion of Halifax, Halifax Harbor. Um, Halifax Harbor, you know, Halifax is a city of about half a million people. Halifax Harbor, you know, it's quite an industrialized harbor. We have a large container port. We have um, several, um, several sewage outfalls. You know, we have various industries located around the basin. Um, the basin itself, you know, receives from these uh, sewage treatment plants. It's fairly eutrophied. But on the other hand, at least in the surface waters, there's, there's quite a lot of tidal flushing. So the ocean chemistry is actually fairly reflective and the, um, the phytoplankton and biology in the basin is somewhat, is fairly reflective of the outer um, continental, uh, continental shelf in the region. 
Um, so we can sort of think of it maybe as this little experimental or mesocosm system for um, the viscosa shelf in the region. Um, itself in Barefoot Basin and what the Barefoot Basin Monitoring Program is, is since the last 25 years, people have measured, made these weekly measurements, CTD cast and bottle nutrient measurements in the surface and deep water every Wednesday since about 1998. This is primarily started by DFO, scientists at Barefoot Institute of Oceanography, but um, continued on and added to by Miopar and now most recent by the Ocean Frontier Institute here in Dalhousie. And the main addition to that um, was a, um, we've constantly been adding parameters to this uh, time series, in particular carbonate system water column parameters in uh, 2019. The time series is centered right in the center in the deep portion of the basin. If we look in cross section right about here, and this inner portion of the basin really has a sort of fjord type uh, circulation. It has a shallow cell right here um, in the narrow, so right at this constriction point. And so where we have estuarine circulation, so outflow at the surface, inflow at about 10 to 20 meters depth, the presence of that cell really isolates the deep waters of the basin from about 20 to 70 meters throughout most of the year. And it really only gets mixed either in the spring by um, overturning, you know, convective cooling of the surface waters or these periodic intrusions of dense Scotia shelf water that makes it over the cell. Um, and if we look at maybe a little bit more detail to set the stage for the rest of my talk. So this is showing a sort of climatology of the bottom water at 60 meters in terms of oxygen. So we see this reoxygenation in the spring and this drawdown of oxygen throughout the, uh, the rest of the year. Um, the, the gray shading is kind of the, um, the entire range of the data collected during this, uh, throughout these 25 years of time series data. Uh, the bottom shows the PhD, pH measurements collected since about 2015. And again, we see this quite a range in pH um, from you know, closer to maybe surface ocean values getting close to eight in the spring and then more acidic values as we, um, as we move into, the, um, into later in the year where respiration dominates the deep water and stratification prevents its mixing from the overlying water. And I think this kind of speaks a little bit to what Justin mentioned too, when people often think of OA in terms of an open ocean, um, open ocean context, but when we're dealing with coastal oceans, we're dealing with, you know, much greater fluctuations, whether there was a diurnal or seasonal is shown here and teasing apart that, you know, increase or long-term signal from these, you know, widely varying um, environments um, can be difficult without these sort of high resolution uh, time series. Um, my role in this was really to think about, you know, we have this long water column time series, but we haven't thought much about what has been going on in the sediments during this time and how much that flux of um, that balance between DIC and alkalinity flux to the sediments might be influencing these bottom water pH values. Um, this is probably particularly relevant in an area where there's um, these large fluctuations in bottom water oxygen, because that could really influence, might potentially influence that balance between aerobic and anaerobic respiration. So measuring in a sediment is maybe a little bit difficult. It's, you know, it's not as easy to stick a sensor in the sediment and make these measurement, long-term measurements, measuring sediment in the field is more difficult than maybe making bottom or niskin, you know, CTD casts or niskin bottom water, uh, um, niskin casts or niskin bottle measurements. Um, it's a bit more labor intensive, takes a bit more time. Um, I just thought I would just outlined how I am um, going about doing this. So we're primarily using um, benthic landers, which this is a collaboration with the University of Gothenburg. So we're using um, the benthic landers by from Pear Hall's group over there. So they've been on loan to us for about a year. You can see a picture of it here out in um, Bedford Basin. Um, where we're deploying it for the first time. So it has these two chambers with various sensors, oxygen, temperature, turbidity, salinity in them. And then you can just see it has these syringe racks, which we can program to, to um, 
to uh, make discrete samples of the overlying water inside the chambers at various points in time. And then we can use the concentration to um, change the concentration in the chamber to measure the flux. Our landers are, um, are useful because they less, lessen the effects of sediment sampling or artifacts collected with collecting sediment cores and maybe doing the same experiment back to the lab, which comes particularly challenging when you're trying to preserve in situ redox conditions that would exist when you're dealing with somewhere which isn't at you know, atmospheric oxygen concentrations, and you do have these cycles of hypoxia. Um, here you can just see a few student, student lab tech in my lab, um, you know, processing one of these syringe racks after an incubation experiment. Um, so this takes quite a lot of effort. Um, so we can't do it, you know, on the same resolution as the time series. Um, we probably don't need to because sediments aren't as dynamic as the overlying water column on um, the kind of that, you know, short term variability is a bit dampened out. However, we are trying to make measurements over a scale of variability we would might expect. So for example, measurements in the springtime and the fall based upon that gradient of bottom water hypoxia and with um, and with uh, with depth since depth could have an influence on, you know, sediment type, the amount of organic matter loading um, the sediments um, may receive, plus in addition, you know, the degree of low oxygen conditions the sediment might experience over the run of the year. Um, so we've done as initial tests last fall, which is what I will show now. Um, we've done one fall sampling. We actually just completed our spring sampling, which is actually, it was related to that, that I had the scheduling conflict, which resulted in me not being able to, uh, to present in the last, um, the last webinar. Um, so as an initial test, we did two stations, one at 30 meters, one at um, one at 70 meters, um, where we did one of these um, benthic lander incubation experiments. And just as an example, I'll maybe show the 30 meter station. So this what we called station one. This is the data we get from the lander, um, temperature, salinity. Um, we use salinity, we inject at the start of an incubation, a bit of fresh water and measure that change in salinity to calculate the chamber volume, which is important for calculating the flux. Um, but then what I'll draw attention to is the oxygen. So we see the pink is the background bottom water oxygen at about 100 and, you know, about 120 micromolar. And then the red and blue is the oxygen concentration inside the chamber. And we can see during the two day incubation, the drawdown in oxygen concentration and giving, you know, this nice, at least initial linear decrease showing, um, showing oxygen consumption in the sediments themselves. We also took bottle um, in the syringes, taking the syringe samples, we can then measure um, total, we can measure alkalinity and DIC. This is in two separate chambers um, during the same deployment. And we can see an increase in alkalinity in both chambers with over time. So again, this is about a two day flux experiment and an increase in, um, in dissolved inorganic carbon. Um, we can use these to calculate rates, and there we can say our alkalinity fluxes from the sediment about 20 millimole per meter square per day, and likewise, you know, slightly similar for the um, dissolved inorganic carbon. So at this chamber, at this depth, we are having significant both alkalinity and DIC fluxes out from the sediment, probably indicating that a lot of the, despite the fact of having an overlying oxygenated water column, a lot of the remineralization is occurring anaerobically and there isn't necessarily a lot of reoxidation of those secondary um, byproducts of that remineralization occurring. Um, we can also just, I'll show quickly the deep station, shallow station compared to the deep station. So this is our shallow station comparing oxygen fluxes compared to DIC in total alkalinity fluxes. And then we can also compare our deep station, which um, I can't see because all your pictures are over it on my screen, but you can see we have about a factor of two increase in alkalinity flux and DIC. So even in this short, um, just because of that difference in depth, even though, you know, spatially these stations are only separated by, you know, about a kilometer, um, you can see dramatically different um, you know, much stronger alkalinity and DIC fluxes at the deeper station than the uh, than the shallow station.
Um, we don't just do these benthic chambers. We also collect sediment cores. We bring them back to the lab. We extract pore water using rhizome samplers shown here. We can measure DIC and as shown here in the core water, and we can see very dramatic, you know, these dramatic increases with uh, with depth. Um, we can also make um, microsensor measurements to measure pH, oxygen, those sort of gradients really close to the sediment surface. Um, that's what's shown here. And then we take those fluxes I just showed, the pore water chemistry. We use all that to try and parameterize, although I don't have any of this to show right now, we're still working on it, a diagenetic model where we can then use, once we have a suitably that describes the remineralization and distribution of byproducts of remineralization in the sediment itself, and we can attribute the remineralizer carbon to various rates and predict or model fluxes to the overlying water. The idea being that if we can do this, once we have a suitably parameterized model, we can do that over a range of expected conditions that um, a range of maybe bottom water conditions or something that we can maybe more easily measure in a monitoring, you know, kind of monitoring time series program like we have in Bedford Basin and then use that to maybe parameterize the impacts of the um, of the sediments or parameterize those by um, sediment alkalinity and DIC fluxes as a function of those more easily measured parameters. And then, you know, maybe once in a while, periodically check it with these detailed um, sediment uh, biogeochemical studies that I've just um, indicated. So I guess maybe to finish up in terms of summary, um, I just want to maybe get across the point that um, sediments can be a source of both DIC and um, and alkalinity, and the balance between those two could influence how sensitive coastal waters are to larger scale uh, pH changes. Um, the sense, the balance between these two again is probably determined largely by the balance between aerobic and anaerobic mineralization, and to what degree that anaerobic byproducts of anaerobic mineralization may be consumed by these secondary redox equate reactions or interactions with mineral phases. Again, you know, because this is redox sensitive, there could be feedbacks to eutrophication and hypoxia. And then I guess if there's a recommendation about how to, I would say, you know, I think it is important in some of these environments where there might be seasonal changes in bottom water oxygen or places where there's restricted flow where um, the byproducts of benthic fluxes could accumulate, it's probably good to thinking about doing, you know, maybe, maybe not at the same resolution that you might do water column monitoring, but maybe periodically doing some of these more detailed targeted sediment biogeochemical um, investigations to understand how processes and remineralization processes in the sediments may be affecting, affecting fluxes of alkalinity or DIC to the overlying water column to get a sense of how that might be impacting um, the buffering capacity of these waters. So, so I think that's about all I had to say. Um, so I can just uh, leave it there. And once again, thanks for um, hearing what I had to say. Yeah, thank you so much for that amazing presentation, Chris. Uh, I just wanna point out that we are at time right now. And I understand if, if anyone has to jump off at this point. Uh, however, for the sake of still having a discussion with the presenters today, I am going to turn it over to Ivy to moderate the discussion between the steering committee and today's presenters. Thanks, Austin, and thanks, presenters. That was some really interesting um, pre uh, presentations today. We've got um, some great questions from our steering committee, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, dive right into those. I think we're going to try to stick around for an extra 10 minutes for Q&A and discussion. Folks who have to jump off, just remember that we are recording this, so you can always come back later to listen to the Q&A session um, in, in case you want to you know, hear every second of this, this interesting conversation. So I'll dive right in. Um, Shannon, I think this question is for you. Um, how do we monitor for reproductive changes in benthic organisms? Uh, is benthic recruitment presently being actively monitored? So they look, 
So you have things like um, HabCam that will go back and look at the year classes. And, but to look at, that's how they look at reproduction in the field. To look at egg output and everything else is more difficult. And what the controlling factor is that's driving it is even more difficult. And I think the laboratory experiments can help us tease some of that apart. Um, because when a uh, benthic organism spawns, they're in the water column and they release, like for bivalves, their mass, they release millions and millions of eggs and sperm and the likelihood that one will interact with another. And if you get one of those millions that settles, it has to be enough to sustain the population. And in between, the top and the bottom, a lot can happen. Um, so they look at year class recruitment and that's what they end up looking at to look at whether or not it was a good year or a bad year. But to actually look at gonad development, you could weigh it if you take samples out in the field. You could then look at the conditions and try to do linear mix models. Uh, some people try to measure a whole bunch of environmental parameters and then look at the, the conditions if they are a dominant driver of what you're observing. And you can do lab experiments, which we have been doing the last three years. Results soon to come. Thank you very much, Shannon. It's insightful. Um, Justin, a question for you. Did crustaceans require more food to calcify at lower omega levels? And would increasing the temperatures influence that process? Um, we did not test, we did not vary food or temperature in that experiment. Um, but I would, if I had to guess, I think that giving them more food would make them more resilient because gives them more energy to, you know, manipulate the carbonate chemistry at, at their site of calcification, which is really the, where the rubber hits the road for, for calcifiers. Um, in terms of temperature, um, you know, temp temperature, depending on the organism, can be a double-edged sword. It can increase metabolisms, make them more plastic in their responses, and more resilient to acidification. But then if it, it starts to stress them out, uh, you know, it can, um, exacerbate the effects of acidification. So it really depends how extreme that temperature effect is, whether it's it's just enhancing their metabolism, it'd probably be a benefit. But if it's you know stressing them, then it's it's going to compound the effects of acidification. Yeah. But there yeah, there has a lot been a lot of work done on, you know, and we've done a lot of studies too since then, pairing temperature um, and acidification. And in, in most cases, you know, when you combine them, you know, the, the effects are, are, you know, negative. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so kind of, I think following on that in terms of multiple drivers um, and considerations in your uh, experimental design, are metrics such as mineral, mineral, mineralogy or tissue quality currently regularly monitored or should they be part of the biological suite of observations of an observing system? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think those are both critical things. Um, you know, the mineralogy, you got two aspects of the mineralogy. If, if their mineralogy, if their polymorph mineralogy is changing and they're bimineralic, the the structure is going to be compromised in a way that may not be reflected in just looking at the change in calcification rate. Example being the the whelk, you know, they didn't they didn't their calcification rates didn't decline as much as you would expect based on the strength tests. They they really suffered because they lost that more soluble layer of aragonite that was between the calcite layers. Um, so to that extent, it's it's useful to look at. It's also useful to look at from a predictive standpoint because aragonite and high magnesium calcite is more are more soluble than, than low magnesium calcite. The more magnesium in the calcite, the more unstable the mineral is, the more easy it is to dissolve. So uh, it, it's not a controlling factor. You know, aragonitic organisms are not universally more vulnerable to acidification than low magnesium calcitic organisms. Um, but if you look within within a class, for example. The aragonitic ones tend to be more vulnerable than the calcitic ones. 
you know, the, the, in, the inner taxonomic variation is larger than the mineralogical effects. But if you, if you standardize everything, like if you look at clams as a rule, aragonitic bivalves uh, fare worse than calcitic bivalves in OA experiments. Um, can I add on to that? So a lot of times, um, traditionally in bivalve, people will look at condition index, but the problem when you do that with OA experiments is we're already seeing the shells are lighter, even if they're the same size, because the calcification is changing. Um, if they don't have, according to the dynamic energy budget model, if they don't have enough reserves by eating and something's being changed, like their catabolic processes are higher, they will take, they will basically use their tissues. And oftentimes as they come out of winter, you will see if the plankton bloom isn't timed exactly right and they need to develop gonads, they will use reserves in order to develop those gonads. So measuring tissue with other environmental parameters can give you an idea of what's going on, but you've got to be careful using condition index under ocean acidification because most of the literature suggests that that calcification is changing and so you can get a false sense of good conditions when, in fact, the shells are getting lighter or thinner. That, I don't know if you agree, uh, Justin, but that's... Yeah, yeah, maybe just for the benefit of the audience. So the condition index is a ratio of the, of the tissue to the space in the shell. So they're growing, they're calcifying more slowly, the shell is going to be smaller. So you can get this false sense of having a higher condition index only because their calcification rate in their shell is smaller. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, definitely. Thank you both for weighing in on those questions. Chris Hunt, I see that you popped up on the screen here. Did you want to contribute to this discussion? Yeah, I did. Um, and first, thank you, everyone. Those were wonderful. And um, I appreciate you taking the time. And so we've been keeping this sort of document of questions. And this I didn't write this question. And so I'm going to try and paraphrase it be just because I want to try and think big about all three of your presentations because the points of this webinar series is to help us think about uh, a, an observing system or a monitoring system for OA. But um, it's especially um, from the talks that we heard today, these are all really labor intensive studies, right? There's a lot of people power and somewhat not suited for just throwing a sensor in the water, right? Um, which is the easy way you can monitor things. Mm -hmm. um, so I, and this is not a very specific question, but I'd love to get anybody's thoughts about how you might bridge that gap or choose between sort of a really resource intensive study, at, you know, maybe a site, maybe three sites, like Shan was showing, we have these three regions within our purview versus a kind of long-term monitoring network, which is kind of a different thing and might not be really suited for some of the um, questions and issues that you all were talking about. So again, I'm sorry, that's not a very specific question, but if you have any thoughts about sort of technologically driven monitoring versus human powered biological observations and how you might get around those two. I think Shannon had a slide that kind of showed some ideas, stuff that I'm not really familiar with, but I'd love to get anybody's thoughts. Cameras. I'm wondering what AIs can do with for us with cameras. I mean, yeah, cameras are being cameras are you being used to show essential fish habitats for oyster reefs. Can we put cameras out there and get AIs to basically help us determine what changes are going on? Are we getting changes in predator prey reactions because of acidification or changes that are occurring? Um, I am not AI savvy, <laughs> but I'd head in that direction. I think you need to pick sites that are close and easy to access so they aren't as labor intensive. Um, I think we need to think of sites that also use other federal agencies. For example, some habitats are within the range. Fire Island, great habitat for some of the um, federally mandated species and it's part of a protective park services agency. Um, cameras, cameras are the way I'd go right now with some sensors. 
I can maybe add a bit to that. And I think um, your point to picking, I think easy to access sites is a good one because I think of the, you know, the, the stuff I showed today obviously is labor intensive, particularly the sediment stuff. That's not something that's going to be done on a regular, regular basis. But on the other hand, that time series, we have been able to have people go out every morning once or once a week on a Wednesday morning and make those, uh, make those measurements. And it doesn't take, you know, I think it, it doesn't, I mean, we're lucky that we're in a place with two oceanographic research institutions and the, um, and the infrastructure to have a boat and a few people that can go out and drop a CTD cast and take some bottles. And then, you know, it takes a while to run the samples after, but they do get, they do get done and having, you know, even if it's in one specific place, having that high resolution time series is really important. And then maybe supplementing it with, um, with periodic, more detailed investigations, like I showed for the sediment over, um, you know, maybe the range of ability variability you might expect. And I'm hoping once we do that a few times, we can maybe relate some of the changes we see or have these, you know, particularly combining the detailed studies with models where we can do, you know, change boundary conditions and stuff and maybe relate things to measurements, whether it's a bottom water oxygen measurement or something where we can make more high resolution um, measurements. And of course, keeping you know, thinking that sensor technology is improving all the time. So although we still do this manually off a boat with, uh, with a CTD cast, um, as we, as sensors improve, you know, we, um, we can maybe do more of this autonomously and less often, whether it was with, you know, a small remote ROV or putting a sensor package down in the bottom of the basin, which we, um, which we have done and, you know, certainly oxygen sensors are now reliable enough, you know, this alkalinity sensors are being developed, pH sensors are getting more reliable all the time. So I think, you know, our ability to do that is going to only get better. Can I add on one more thing? We might have to think of model organisms. I mean, going out to Georgia's banks to do some of this on sea scouts may be more difficult, but you've got Hurricane Island up in um, the Gulf of Maine, and maybe that would be an ideal place to do sea scouts because that's easily accessible. And some species, um, for example, about a month ago, we walked out onto Milford Shore and saw surf clamps, like right here. We could walk to the study site if we uh, had known they were there. Um, so again, it's, it's finding and using potentially model species might have to be the way we go because we can't get out there all the time. Um, to is using and identifying model species that we want to start some of this with um, and seeing using lab experiments to see if model if the model species if like if they behave the same in the lab. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see the, the value in that. I mean, I would advocate for for choosing a site, you know, and and really setting it up almost like an LTER. And then, and then within that site, um, you know, looking at natural gradients in carbon and chemistry, and you know that that opens up a broader range of organisms that you can look at. You know, the hard the hardest thing to to tie the the, the lab experiments to the field experiments, which is what everybody wants to do, is characterizing the the, the carbon and chemistry in the field. Um, you know, you know, even on George's Bank, we just went out there a few times and did bottle samples and assumed that that's what the scallops were seeing. But that's not what there is. It probably is representative, but it, it, but there was more variability in there. So to have a, a place where the system is already instrumented and we know the gradients, we know the seasonal variation, we're getting direct measurements of alkaline and DIC, not calculating them, but making you know false assumptions of equilibrium between using pH and PCO2 or whatever, and then letting uh, you know letting whatever whatever group of organisms someone studies you know, focus on that, whether whether it be, you know, bivalves, urchins, you know, rhizoans, um, you know, people could probably find their system within that within that environment, uh, if, if we choose it wisely. And, and but but and the reason I suggest that is that that to, to me seems to be the hardest thing getting a real solid handle on the, the carbonate variability, you know, in a natural system, 
to do natural acidification experiments. You know, and like, you know, in Europe, they, they do the vents at the Med C. Um, they have something going on. Guillemar does a similar thing in, in Kiel, it's looking at the natural gradient in the harbor there. Um, you know, we, really, we don't really have that kind of site anywhere in New England. Thank you. This is really interesting conversation. I think will be really useful in informing us as we move towards the development of our regional monitoring strategy. Um, some really important things to think about here. I really want to say thank you to all of our presenters. Um, this is really great conversation. I appreciate you sticking around for an extra 15 minutes to have this conversation with us. Um, I'm not sure who's still left on here, but if there are any uh, steering committee members who want to come on camera or on mic and uh, ask one final question, I would I would open up the floor for that opportunity. Otherwise, I'm going to pass it over to um, Emily or Austin to close us out. Thanks, Ivy. Um, Austin had to jump off uh, just for another call right after um, this one. But I just wanted to thank everybody again. Um, thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Chris, for your presentations. Um, we have a bit of a break before our, the next webinar in this series. Um, so that's going to be on Tuesday, July 18th. Um, information about that webinar, and I think there's one more webinar after that, are also up on our website. Um, this webinar was recorded. So um, this recording and the one from our webinar um, this past Monday will be available on the NECAN website tomorrow. Um, and we'll also send out an email to everybody as well, letting them know that that's available. So thanks everybody. Thanks so much for um, staying a little bit late with us and, and for those great presentations and discussion.